Well, when I started, uh, I actually started working for Herb Kelleher, who was the founder of Southwest before Southwest was in existence. I went to work for Herb as his legal secretary in 1967. Southwest was incorporated as a, you know, company on a piece of paper. Herb was a lawyer, and um, he incorporated the company in 1967. We got our, on a piece of paper, we got our original certificate of public convenience and necessity in 1968, and then we spent the next three and a half years in litigation uh, because of all the bad guys out there that tried to keep us out of the air, saying there was no need for competition. And uh, so it was quite a, um, quite a story, actually. And um, I went to work officially on the Southwest Airlines payroll. We put our first airplane into the air in June of 1971. But Herb had hired an operating president, and he never had any intention of running the airline or, or really having anything to do with the airline other than being on the board. He loved the practice of law. And then in 1978, that operating president um, left and um, Herb was asked to run the company on an interim basis, um, you know, just until we could find, do, conduct an executive search. And so at that time, there was a law in Texas, which there may still be a law today about it, that you couldn't be president and um, corporate secretary of the company at the same time of any company in Texas. And Herb was the corporate secretary for Southwest. So I took the title corporate secretary in 1978, in March. And um, Herb took the just interim um, CEO and president position. And um, I just fell in love with it at that time. And, and it was several years later before Herb actually went on the Southwest payroll. <laughs> it's kind of funny how life evolves sometimes. I think that uh, Southwest is a very conscious um, capitalism-based uh, company. I'd never really heard that expression uh, until a couple of years ago when I was asked to speak to a group called Conscious Capitalism. And um, I said, well, yeah, I'm happy to speak to you, but I'm not sure <laughs> what it is that you believe. And uh, I went down and spent a couple days with them in Austin, Texas, and I was quite impressed. And um, I, I think that we uh, believe that there, a better name for them would be conscientious capitalists, myself, personally. We care very much about the community. We, very, we, we care very much about um, serving um, not only um, our own employees and our passengers, but really serving the community as good neighbors. Um, as being as paying back um, to um, communities for in terms of community service, in terms of um, human relationships, in terms of doing good, doing the right thing for people, and um, we have a um, huge um, um, pride about uh, practicing the golden rule at all times. If you didn't. Um, it, if you didn't know what our mission statement was, although it'd be pretty hard not to if you were ever on any of our locations because it's posted about every three feet everywhere. Um, if, if you walked up to an employee and they couldn't repeat it to you verbatim, which they probably could, uh, if they just said to you, we are expected to practice the golden rule every day, um, first with each other and then with our passengers, they would be right. So we just think that you should treat people with respect and you should treat people the way you want to be treated. And uh, we try to do that every single day. We, um, we have um, th really three core values that, um, that, we, um, that may not sound like values uh, to many people. But we um, basically tell people that, first of all, the, the number one value that we have, so we actually have three and a half, because the number one is the most important and that is safety. You can't be in the airline business and not have safety as your number one value in everything that you do, both safety internal and external. But short of that, 
we say that we have three values that we think are critically important. One is the warrior spirit, um, which to us means that you have to work very hard to be the best that you can be. Um, you have to, uh, we want you to actually work as hard as you play. Um, and we want you to um, give what, have a whatever it takes attitude 24 seven. So um, that's what warrior spirit means to us. You can't give up, you cannot give up. You've got, you've got to charge forward and you gotta try to be the best. Won't always win, but you gotta try to be the best. The second one is um, the, a servant's heart. And the servant's heart is where the golden rule comes in, um, where the word love comes in, uh, where the whole customer service passion, you can't talk about servant's heart and not say that you're on this earth to serve. And um, it's, it's where servant leadership comes in. You know, I never even heard the expression servant leadership until, you know, a few years back when I read uh, Peter Grinsley's uh, book on servant leadership. But I think I was born to be a servant leader because I love to serve. I love to serve causes. I love to serve missions. And I love to serve people. So um, that's where the whole servant's heart comes in. And, and, and the love is, you know, wholesome and, and, and um, you know, family oriented. Um, treat others the way you would like to be treated is pretty darn simple. And then the third one, which is very unusual in corporate America, is we want people to have a fun, loving attitude. So we want people to smile because they want to, not because they have to. We want people who um, lean toward the customer as opposed to away from. We want uh, people who do not think that work has to be dull and boring and people that don't think they have to put their personality on the shelf or on the bed when they go to work in the morning and then put it back on when they go home. We want the same people that have fun and enjoy their families and their relatives and their neighbors and whatever. We want those people to shine through the way they do off the clock when they're on the clock. And that's what makes work enjoyable and not drudgery. So we don't want people to drag themselves out of bed and say, oh, I wish it was a Saturday if they happen to be a Monday to Friday worker, or, oh my gosh, I just wish I didn't have to go in today. We don't expect everyone to come running in on roller skates because they, you know, but we want people to actually look forward to work. And I really think that most of our employees do. Well, you, you have to look for people um, that want to, first of all, that want to enjoy what they do. We won't hire anyone that doesn't want to serve. And when I use that word, I don't mean in a, you know, to be subservient. I mean, we don't want anybody that doesn't want to recognize and practice the thought that we are in the customer service business. We happen to provide airline transportation. So if you don't want to serve a cause and you don't want to serve a passion and a vision to be the best that you can be in terms of legendary or exemplary customer service delivery, doesn't mean that you're a bad person, but it probably means you are not going to be very, you know, very comfortable in our environment. Um, so we look for people that um, don't, they will take the business very seriously, but not themselves. We look for people that want to lean toward solution versus toward confrontation. We look for people that are warm and caring and, and actually altruistic. Um, we look, believe it or not, we look for people who have a fun-loving attitude. We don't think that life <clears throat> or work has to be all stiff and robotic. We think it should be much more personal and laid back and real, genuine. Um, we think that um, people should enjoy what they're doing. And if they enjoy it and feel empowered to make decisions based upon what they believe is the right thing to do, then we think that they're going to almost feel like they're not at work. Uh, they're just enjoying life on the clock as much as they do 
off the clock. So we encourage people to really be the individual selves that makes them special people. And we may not always know exactly what those ingredients are that cause a person to be warm and spirited and fun loving, but we can usually figure out those things in a way that we can encourage that to be, you know, to be the individual that you are. So you, you usually know what your strengths are. Most people know what your, their strengths are and what their weaknesses are. And um, if you just capitalize on the strengths and, um, you know, tr try to just leave the weaknesses somewhere else, then, you know, it's going to be a fairly happy team. And if you support each other and bring out the best in each other, which is what we really strive to do, um, people just usually enjoy life a lot more. And, you know, they smile because they want to, not because they have to. And, and they, um, they work because they have a dedication and a, and a goal, uh, really, of being the best. Uh, and we empower people to make customer service decisions. We don't dictate um, to them what every single customer service decision should be because you just can't. Authenticity to me, and I think to most people at Southwest, is to be down to earth, real human beings um, with no airs, and um, to mean what you say and say what you mean. <laughs> That's a hard one uh, to not be actively involved in a company that I feel, you know, is my baby. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult. It, wa it wasn't difficult to step down. I think that leaders need to know when to step down and let the next generation lead. And I think it was time to do that. Um, at the same time, being the sentimental person that I am and being kind of known as the mom um, of Southwest, um, it, you know, pulls on your heartstrings a little bit to let your baby chickadees go off all kind of by themselves. So um, our new CEO, or our current, and he's not so new today, but our current CEO was very kind in allowing um, Herb and I, as part of our severance arrangement, to keep our office and our small staff uh, for five years so that at least from a, a morale standpoint, uh, from a cultural standpoint, there was still a bit of a connection there because they really do think of Herb and Colleen as kind of the mom and pop. And, um, and you know, just not that we're engaged in the day-to-day -day activities or, 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 or operations or decisions because we're not, um, but we are there sort of as cheerleaders and uh, sort of as nurturers. And um, so we, you know, continue to celebrate with our employees when there's something to celebrate or to, you know, suffer with them when they're suffering or, um, you know, if they're in pain, we try to be supportive and that sort of thing. For me, I don't know that I've had much of a legacy except maybe um, to, um, I think that I am a living example, honestly. Uh, maybe this is a legacy, I don't know. I, I, I think that I am a living example that if you work hard and you really care about people and you practice golden rule behavior and you don't have a cockiness about you and you just want to make a positive difference, that people will let you make that positive difference and they will support you it, it, they will, if you are kind to others, they will be kind back to you. And it really goes back to my very young um, days. I, I was very, very poor. I mean, my, my mother raised three kids really basically by herself and um, we didn't have a lot, but she had a lot of love. And she always taught me, there's always someone worse off than you are. And, um, and she always said, you should always offer a helping hand, no matter what. And I didn't realize until years later, if, if someone rang our doorbell 
and it was supper time, she'd invite the person to sit down at the dinner table. I mean, this is a silly little story, but it, it's had a profound impact on me as I thought about it over the years. <clears throat> she would just invite the person to sit down. She didn't know any other way. Now, it was only years later that I realized she was giving up her meal because literally there wasn't enough for another person. But that's the kind of person that she was because she was loving and caring. And when she died many, many years later, but you know, 15 years ago now, or 16 even, um, I was at her house going through her things, and I, I laughed until I cried when, because she still didn't really have anything except a huge heart. But she left me all these notes <laughs> about who was to get what. And I mean, she was sending clothes to a nursing home that really I don't think the Salvation Army would have taken, but that's who she was because she was always trying to be kind to others. So we have tried to sort of um, implant that idea into Southwest. And I think the thing that makes me the proudest is people get it. When you, when you reach out a, a hand to somebody when they're hurting, um, it, they don't ever forget it. You don't do it for that reason. You do it because you've got a good heart. But you do it because you're trying to be helpful and that person will remember it forever. I was really, really poor and a single working mom that didn't have anything for several years. And I had people that helped me along the way and I was too proud to ask for help, but I had people help me. Well, when I started you know, making some money, then I tried to, to actually pay that back in another way. And I can remember one guy saying to me, one boss saying to me, look, you don't have to pay me back, but someday you'll be in a position to do this for somebody else, will you just do that? And I've done it 10 times over, and, and I hope the people, I've done the same thing, said the same thing to those people. I think that's the legacy to, if there is one, I think it's um, to make people realize that you can contribute even if you don't think you have a real area of expertise. You can make life's, people's lives better by just being a positive influence, by being a positive contributor and a positive supporter of that person. And you can help another person earn self-esteem that didn't feel they had any. I think I have gotten 10 times more from Southwest than, South, than I've ever given Southwest, really. I do think that Southwest takes really good people who want to do the right thing and make, turns them into, allows them to be even better people collectively. They can do more together as teams and families. And um, I have watched it. I mean, I've watched people that have just, I mean, it's, it, I, I am such a sentimental slob. I love watching people feel I can do that. It's like watching a kid walk for the first time, you know. My God, I really can contribute something. I really can do something. In the beginning, you have to remember, I'm not from Texas, so I can say this. Everyone in Texas thinks they're bigger and better than everybody else, okay? That's just the way Texans are. So when we started and all we had all the people against us, everybody was against us, we became the best David and Goliath story in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So we had no money, not a penny. We didn't have $148 in the bank when we finally put our first plane in the air. I believe that if our competitors had left us alone, we probably would have been bankrupt in eight months because we didn't know what the heck we were doing. On the other hand, when they started to fight us and we became the underdog and we were serving Love Field, right, we developed LUV as our stock symbol on the New York Stock Exchange we put our girls in hot pants and go-go boots, so we were really sort of selling sex in the 19, you know, literally, figuratively, not literally,
but we were we were in there were nothing but cowboys flying there, there weren't there weren't women flying there were businessmen on business accounts and just, otherwise if you flew you were rich so flying was thought of for the elite we tried to turn it into flying for the common man on the street you know the just the people the common guy and and that's we did that well well over time that love turned from a more you know sort of hot and sexy and romantic and you know there's nothing hot and sexy and romantic about flying since 9-11 it's not fun right I mean we try to still make it warm and caring but it's it's not the best of experiences so we try to make it efficient and work for you but and but anyway so it's 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 evolved over you know a 41 year record of going sort of from more the hot sexy stuff to more you know American flag and apple pie and you know and that sort of thing and then more of a a uh, nurturing, happy family, we're all in this together, we're going to do the best we can and we're going to try to enjoy each other. We're going to try to enjoy 50 minutes together or three hours together or whatever it is. That came from the love. When we, um, when we very, very first started, um, we ha our logo was the tail of the airplane, you know, just the little three-colored tail and we had a slanted heart. We had a slanted heart underneath it, kind of, it wasn't upside down, but it was just sort of slanted. And we kept that on our stationery for at least our first 10 years and maybe even longer. And um, then we changed it, but we've always tried to keep the heart. We have hearts on our airplane. Um, we give heart awards. Um, we give love awards, we give POS awards, Positively Outrageous Service awards. Um, we, um, we incorporate the heart into almost everything we do. So when we started having very special anniversaries, like our 10th anniversary, 20th, 30th, 40th now, um, we always try to incorporate the wings with the heart in the middle um, as part of who we are, just reminding people again of the love. It's a subtle thing but it's very important to us because that's what we're all about. I totally, I, I totally agree that the more that you can accomplish together as a group, the more psychic satisfaction you're gonna have personally over how you're spending your time. You know, I, it, this is kind of disappointing to some of my um, female friends, but I never had a career path. I never had goals or a ladder that I was trying to climb. All I wanted to do was to be part of a successful team that was doing good, okay? That's all I ever wanted. I didn't care what my title was. I go and talk to high schools. I go and talk to colleges. I do MBA classes. I do all of it. And I say to every single one of them that asks, don't ever take a job for a paycheck or a title. Take a job only when you know that you can be passionate about what they stand for and that you want to serve that purpose every day. Now in my case it's easy because customer service has always been my passion. Customer service, when I was a legal secretary, meant I had to make my boss look great. And I did a pretty darn good job of it, you know? And I had to make his clients feel good about what they were receiving. And I had to be efficient, I had to be productive, I had to be on time, I had to be reliable. All those things that we've taken, all of those traits that we've taken and turned them into how does it what does it take to be a successful airline? You can't hold anybody accountable if they're your employees if you don't hold yourself accountable first. So you have to kind of tell people what the expectations are and then you have to walk the talk yourself or else it's kind of like a parent, you know, do as I say, not as I do. You know, that doesn't work. <laughs> I had a dad like that. It just doesn't work. So 
it's just kind of interesting. Growing means developing, and playing means that it's a, one big game, but an enjoyable game where you can be learning and playing and growing all at the same time. I think vision is um, a belief and a dream um, of something really good that can be um, concocted or, or um, made with so much passion and devotion and love that it can inspire others and it can turn out to be a beautiful um, plant or organism or cake, <laughs> whatever. It's just, I think that vision just means that you can clearly see the future where it could be a better place. And, um, and, and it can almost, you don't want to define it too much because if you define it, you start limiting it. So it might be my vision for everyone to be better served um, with love and caring and warmth. Um, and it might be your, ver your vision that somebody could, would be better served by, um, you know, fun and laughter and, and joy. And, but if it works for you and it works for me and we both go out there and we try to sort of make the cake together then the receiver is getting the benefit of both of the efforts, or all of the team efforts, if you will, and they're really feeling something very special. Who inspires me? Oh gosh, people inspire me every day. Children particularly inspire me, um, because they just say what they think at all times. I love that. Um, actually, um, I think this is a sort of recent discovery to me, and it may just be because I am becoming one, but elderly people start to, are inspiring to me. Um, I've had great teachers, I've had great writers, I've had um, great, I've heard great priest ministers, it's not particularly a religious thing as much as it is a spiritual thing. Um, Herb Kelleher has always inspired me. Um, Ken Blanchard has always inspired me. Um, there's, I just have people that, you know, Mother Teresa, oh my goodness gracious. Um, it's it, it just, people inspire me every day. You know, my only closing thought is that I wish that more people had the opportunity or took advantage of the opportunity to meet caregivers, to meet um, servant leaders, to listen without judgment to people's vision and inspiration and what turns them on, even if they think that it might not be a turn on to them. Um, I think that everybody has something to offer if you can look for it, you know, deep enough. And if you can spend enough time to find out what it is, and I think that um, I really do believe the more that you give love, the more love you'll get back.